This is the area that receives less rainfall than forested regions, where the subsoil is dry and the upper layers are moist during rainy periods. At one time, tall grasses flourished on the eastern prairies of North America where rainfall was more plentiful. Today, they are only found in well-managed, protected areas. Tall grasses give way to mid-grasses where rainfall is less abundant. Purple and yellow cone flowers, orbs of the mid-grass regions, help brighten the prairie in early summer. Mid-grasses flourish west of the tall grass areas. Short grasses take over in the driest regions of the prairie and semi-arid grass country of the high plains. They are found farther west than the mid-grasses. Grasslands have been more misused by man than probably any other type of habitat. Because of this, our great central grassland is disappearing in North America. Nowhere do we have the primitive plant-animal community as it was in early times. Some of its most important creatures have died out completely. Among the vanished are the white wolf, plains grizzly bear, heath hen, which inhabited the grassy areas along the mid-Atlantic coast, and probably the Eskimo curlew, since none have been seen for several years. Extremely rare is the black-footed ferret, which depended on prairie dog towns for its food and shelter. And the nearly extinct whooping crane, which once bred throughout the northern prairies. At one time, vast herds of bison, commonly called buffalo, roamed our prairie grasslands. Most of our prairie grasslands are gone. Prairie sod has been plowed and has given way to man's crops. Sheep and cattle now graze where once the bison and pronghorn herds roamed freely. Outside of game preserves, one can occasionally see pronghorns mingling with man's domestic animals. The best places to go to get a glimpse of the past are national parks and monuments and wildlife refuges where grasslands are protected. Here one can still watch the remnants of our rich past. The most characteristic rodent of the grasslands is the prairie dog, a member of the squirrel family. At one time, their towns covered hundreds of square miles. It is one of the most interesting, sociable wild animals. A typical prairie dog town is made up of groups of prairie dogs that occupy and protect smaller areas within the community. These groups, called coteries, stay in their own neighborhoods. A typical group consists of one or two adult males and three or four adult females with their young up to a year of age. Members of the coterie cooperate with each other. recognize one another with a kiss. They cooperate in digging burrows, defending their territory, eating together, playing, or standing side by side. When prairie dogs are out of their burrows, they constantly communicate with members of their group or members of neighboring groups. Their messages include warning barks, territorial calls, and tooth chattering. Prairie dogs feed almost entirely on plants, although they will eat insects at times. The energy stored within the prairie dog is transferred to the animal that is lucky enough to capture the prairie dog. Prairie dogs are interrelated with the lives of many other animals in the grasslands. Predators kill them for food. The prairie dog is well adapted to avoid being preyed upon from the sky by hawks, falcons, and eagles. 
Their eyes are located high on the head, so they can see objects which are overhead. Since they are out of their burrows in large numbers most of the time, many eyes are available to spot a possible predator. Rattlesnakes visit the prairie dog community. Their presence creates quite a stir among these rodents. They also help to control the number of prairie dogs. Mice are more suitable in size for the prairie rattler. Snakes use prairie dog burrows to escape from the intense heat of summer days. Spiders often build a web over the mouth of a prairie dog hole in order to snare small insects which fly in or out of the burrow. Burrowing owls use abandoned holes to raise their families, even though they are capable of digging their own burrows. Rabbits are common users of prairie dog burrows and feed on grass in the prairie dog community. Bison often visit the dog towns to wallow in loose earth and feed upon the grasses. They paw at the crater surrounding the burrow and lie down and roll in the loose earth. Such wallowing creates a depression in the earth that collects water after rain. The destroyed grass is replaced by forbs. This is preferred food for the prairie dogs, so the wallowing bison increases the prairie dog food supply. After the original grass cover in the prairie dog town is eaten, it is replaced by forbs. One can see a marked difference between the Forbes in the prairie dog town and the grasses that lie just outside the boundaries of their community. The seeds of Forbes are eaten by harvester and mound ants. These ants build their mounds on top of the prairie dog mound. The burrowing habit of the prairie dog is a form of soil cultivation which exposes subsoil to the invasion of plants. Bison herds may linger in the prairie dog town for a day or two, especially during their running season. All this activity is too much for the prairie dogs, so they spend most of their time in their burrows out of sight. A lone bull, separated from the main herd, overlooks the situation from his vantage point on top of a nearby butte. Risking the hazards of a tumble, he descends down the face of the butte. Still in one piece, and perhaps a bit shaken up, he slowly joins the main herd. While the 
bulls contend for a cow, the cows take no interest in their fights, but simply allow themselves to be escorted away by the victor. The bull is considerably larger than the cow. The tending pair may be accompanied by the cow's spring calf, which has not been weaned yet. Pronghorns often visit prairie dog towns. They usually just pass through. Pronghorns are at home in the mixed prairie grasslands. Often called antelopes, they are members of an American family of animals, different from the African antelopes. They do not use cover for concealment, but stay in open country where they can see great distances and then rely on their speed to escape from their enemies. They erect the hairs on their rumps, which signals danger to other members of the herd. Another hoofed animal of the grasslands is the Thule elk. Its native range was the grasslands of California. By the early 1920s, the total population, having been reduced by shooting and agriculture, was confined to a herd of about 400 animals. Today, a small herd is protected in the Thule Elk Reserve in Southern California. The American elk, or wapiti, foraged in the grasslands bordering forests and mountains throughout most of the United States. Today, it is found only in sizable numbers in large wilderness areas in the West. Cottontails thrive in prairie edge habitats everywhere. Feeding on forbs and grasses, they must have cover and generally rely on hiding from their enemies rather than running. Birds are common over the prairies and plains. One of the most characteristic birds of the grasslands is the meadowlark. It neither hops or runs on the ground but walks, which is uncommon for most birds. Most of its food consists of insects. Grasshoppers are the meadowlark's most important item of food. Grasshoppers are one of the main primary consumers of grass. Magpies also feed on grasshoppers and other insects. Prairie grouse once conspicuous on the grasslands, disappeared as the prairie was broken up for agriculture. The sage grouse, our largest grouse, is found on its booming grounds in early spring. They establish dancing areas, and the cocks compete for the hens in their courtship ritual by inflating their air sacs as they parade before the females. These birds are seldom found far from sagebrush. Today they have disappeared from many of their former haunts. One of the largest birds found on the prairie is the sandhill crane. The near extinction of the larger whooping crane leaves the sandhill the largest representative of the crane family. The cry of the sandhill can be heard for a great distance. Even after it disappears from sight, its sound drifts back like a fading trumpet. Thousands of potholed ponds and marshes left by glaciers throughout the grasslands furnish nesting sites and havens for birds. Avocets feed on aquatic insects by sweeping the bill from side to side. They nest on the mud flats nearby. Coots, or mud hens, construct their nests with dead plant material among the reeds or rushes. 
the young hatch, they feed them aquatic insects. The trumpeter swan is one of our rarer birds. It was a victim of man's thoughtlessness and greed during the 19th century. Today, their population is steadily increasing under effective protection. Great blue herons feed on fish and other aquatic creatures. Because countless potholes and marshes have been drained by man, a marked decline in our water bird population has taken place. What has happened to our world of grass and its native inhabitants? Much of it has fallen under the plow and become the most productive farmland on earth. Our cattle and sheep have crowded out the wild herds. We've placed our surviving buffalo in tame pastures where there is little or no predation. And to prevent overgrazing, a certain number are allowed to be butchered each year. We have poisoned and killed hundreds of thousands of predators for the sake of man's domestic animals. and have so dominated the grasslands that one cannot tell where they once began or ended. Even the sky above the prairies is not sacred from man's dominance as he spreads his pollution. For man's own well-being, we must reverse the destructive trend of our grasslands and assure future generations some of its benefits.